If you've been with us, you know that we just finished a entire series through the Gospel of Mark, and wonderful time in Mark, just studying the life and ministry of Jesus and being reminded of the, his power to overcome the grave and his majesty where he now reigns in the right hand of the Father. Last week, uh, Pastor Kirk, our missions pastor, gave us one final message in Mark chapter 16, just encouraging us in the Great Commission. So thank you to Kirk for doing that. And now we begin a new season. It's kind of the summer months are upon us. And in the summer months, the, the past few years, we've taken time throughout the summer to study a book of the Bible uh, in the wisdom writings. And we're going to continue to do that this year. If you got a bulletin on the way in, you, get, you have a little preview of where we're going. It is in the book of Proverbs. So it says on your bulletin in the very front, instructions for life from the book of Proverbs. Uh, when you study the Proverbs, at least in the amount of time that we have, it's nearly impossible to go verse by verse through 31 chapters. But you can find some very important themes. And from the themes, there is a, a overarching theme that I hope our title uh, that you'll get every week a reminder of will capture. And that is the theme that God wants us to have instructions for our life. And I find that to be uh, an appropriate thing to be interested in. I also find it to be a humbling thing to be interested in. Uh, and maybe some of you can relate to my reaction sometimes to instructions just in general. I don't know if any of you uh, feel this way. I oftentimes, uh, the box will come that says some assembly required. And then you, you open it up and it looks like a thousand very easy pieces to put together. And it's got like an optional uh, little pamphlet called the instruction manual. And if you're like me, oftentimes I think, yeah, I could probably figure that out on my own. And so you, you try and you get to just the second to last step and you realize that sometime very early on in the process, you missed one tiny piece of the puzzle. And now your furniture is sitting at an angle and it can carry no weight and you've got to redo the entire thing. Um, that is the lesson you have to learn over and over again from your childhood when you think about trying to do Legos without the instructions uh, until your adult life when you try to do furniture without the instructions. Uh, college students trying to do classes without the syllabus is very difficult. Uh, and it's a good reference point to how we often treat the word. As we'll find in our very first look at the book of Proverbs, starting in chapter 1, it is filled with the theme of the book being an invitation from God to know wisdom and instruction. And wisdom and instruction for God is God's design not for physical things like furniture, but for your life. And we'll look at over the weeks a number of different ways that we'll get instruction from God's word and apply it to our lives in ways that the Bible will call wisdom or skill for living. And, you know, if you've ever taken any laps around the book of Proverbs, you'll notice that there are 31 chapters. Uh, many people see that as a, a very good reminder. There are 31 days in the, the, the month usually. And so it's a good reminder to read a proverb every day. And yet, so often, we don't. Uh, we, we look to God in ways that can be somewhat a, a surface level or very deep theology when it comes to salvation. But when it comes to how we're designed to live with relationships and marriage and finance and friendship and planning and discretion and our language, we think, yeah, I can probably figure that out on my own. And then you go down a road that turns into a path of destruction. So our goal will be to receive the instruction for the Proverbs so that we can live out God's design, live in wisdom. And we really find this as the introduction to the book of Proverbs. You'll read along with me in Proverbs chapter 1. We can start in verse 1. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And here is a perfect introductory statement to the book. The purpose, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, 
to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. This will set into motion the rest of the book, which is full of wisdom for life, instruction for how to live and to succeed, how to do well with what God has given us in his blueprint for our lives. And we'll, we'll as said, we'll look at a, a, some themes of that over the coming weeks, but before we do, before we look at a, a specific category of life, we start with the foundation of all wisdom. The very thing that will determine which of you listen to this and desire to know more, desire to search out the, the riddles of life through the Proverbs, and which of you think, I could probably figure this out on my own. And so today's theme will actually come to us from verse 7. Look what it says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is all built upon the fear of God in your life. When I think of my approach to instructions now, I have a fear of my wife saying, you better read the instructions, otherwise it's not going to work. And everything that will now flow from the book of Proverbs and all the wisdom that awaits, instruction for your life, will be received if, in fact, you have a fear of God. Contrasted by, it says, but fools despise wisdom. So you either fear God, or as the Proverbs will often do, we understand what it is by a contrast, or you turn into some sort of foolish way of life. The fear of God is one of the most consistent themes in the Bible when trying to understand how to actually know and live for God, and it's full of all sorts of different things that come after the fear of God. There are over 200 verses in the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that talk about the importance of having the fear of God, and then if you do have the fear of God, what will follow? This is a very important thing for us to understand on how to live out God's design for our life. The Proverbs alone have over 20 references to the fear of God in trying to understand a category of your life. The question is, what is it? Nowhere in any of the passages that you will find in a survey of what the fear of God is will you find the Bible giving you a black and white definition so we have to look for some reference points and try to understand what the scripture is getting at when it invites us into a relationship with God that would be called the fear of God. So today we're going to just look at the fear of God so that everything we do from here is built on this foundation, our whole series in Proverbs. So we'll ask three questions, questions that I found myself naturally asking even as I started to study this topic. What is the fear of God? Why does it matter so much to the Lord that we fear him? And with those two things in our view, the final question we'll try to answer is how do we experience it? How do we get the fear of God as a characteristic or a virtue of our lives? So what is the fear of God? And as often is the topic with the fear of God, we start with what it isn't. Because some of you, come into this conversation, maybe for the first time, and you hear the word uh, fear as a four-letter word. Because our culture, our times, not like other times, uh, looks at fear as an absolute negative. I grew up in the 90s, which I, I, I think they're back now based off how the trends of the clothing look, but uh, there was a brand called No Fear Gear. And we all wore it to show that no matter what happened, we weren't going to be afraid. It's like, let's eradicate fear from the hearts and the minds of the youth. Some good in that, but not all good. 
uh, for the older generation, probably too old a reference point for any of you based off your youthful faces, but there was a president named FDR for short, and he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The only thing that you should fear is being afraid, eradicate fear from your life. And of course, without having to go anywhere into the history books, we can think of our own time and place, and one of the worst things you can be labeled is a phobe. If, so, if you disagree with someone or you don't see eye to eye on something, you go into the, 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 the wrong direction in a conversation and you could be labeled phobic of whatever the topic is. And so with those things in mind, we have to talk about what it isn't because what we're not being called to do right now is to be God phobic or afraid of God. In fact, as I was surveying all of these verses, just trying to understand everything that God was calling us to in, 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 in a command, an invitation to fear him, there were some surprising verses that the Bible gives us to help us understand what the fear of God is. Let me share one of them with you as we contrast what fear isn't with what it is in Psalm chapter 25. It says, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. The psalmist says that when you fear God, you're actually entering into an intimate relationship with him. It's a friendship with God to fear him. This is very different than being fearful of God. In fact, this is calling us right back to the original design that God had for man was to walk with man, to be in intimate relationship with man in the garden. The perfect paradise was what we were designed for. It's what redemption is bringing us back to. It's what we grow in our maturity in Christ to become friends and lovers of God once again. And with the original design in mind, we have a perfect contrasting story now. Because it didn't take long in the very beginning for friendship to be broken because the fear of God was broken. Because a temptation to question God's authority versus the authority of someone else. And as a result of disobeying God, look what happens in Genesis chapter 3. We're three chapters into the Bible and we already have an example of what not to think fear of. It says in Genesis chapter 3, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? At this point in the story, Adam and Eve have fallen. They've taken a bite of the knowledge of good and evil, which was a, a, a violation of the command of God. And they are now fully understanding their nakedness before God. And as he calls out to them, looking for them, Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This story is a story of God calling Adam and Eve out of that kind of fear to say, I don't want you to be afraid of me. He actually is going to cover them and put into forth a plan to eradicate a fear of God or being afraid of God. For those of you who think of God as someone that you should be afraid of because of something that you did, that is a fear outside of a relationship with God. That is the fear of hiding something from God. That is the fear of unrepented sin. That is the fear of violating your design, how God made you, and that is not where God wants you to stay. So now let's begin to look at the Proverbs for some more reference points for what the fear of God that we're being invited to looks like. Proverbs chapter three. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And I love the, this moment where we, we get a, a pairing of the fear of the Lord with something that is so good for us. It says, it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones, lest you think that this is a crippling fear. Part of fearing God is a rejection of our own wisdom, a rejection of the knowledge of good and evil, a 
return, a, a, a departure of evil and a return to God's wisdom as our authority. And he says, when you do this, you will have health and you have strength. So when we think about the fear of God, one thing that we have to include with that concept is the healthy fear of God. And this is where we can reject an all-inclusive eradication of fear by just common sense reality that of course there are good and healthy ways to have fear. Last week for Memorial Day, my wife and I and the kids all went up to Sun Valley and we were hanging out by a raging river, very high this time of year, and it was going very fast. And I didn't want any of my kids near it, but the one I was most concerned with was Tommy because he's four and he's a wanderer and he's a curious little guy. So I took him down to the river and I had him stare at it. And I said, Tommy, if you go anywhere near that river, it will destroy you and I'll never see you again. <laughs> I said, what are you gonna do? He said, I am not going to go near it. I said, perfect. Which is strange because the majority of my life I wanna build my kids up and I wanna encourage them and I wanna let them know I'm with them and that they can overcome unhealthy fear. But I also have to instill into them a reverence and respect for things outside of their control. And if we're looking for a fear of God that we could boil down to a working definition, the fear of God in rejecting our own wisdom, departing evil, and experiencing health and strength would be absolute respect of who he is. God has put into motion from the foundations of the earth, wisdom and knowledge and understanding that are perfectly aligned with his design. And the Proverbs are full of all of the wise sayings and teachings to help us live in that design. And when we say we fear God, what we're actually saying is we're afraid of all of the things outside of his design. All of the things that would destroy us if we went anywhere near them. So definition number one, the fear of God is utter respect for the authority of God and his word. Last year we did the Ecclesiastes. We spent all 12 weeks of summer studying the wisdom writings of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. And now we can just sum it up with one tiny reference to it. He says, in the very end, chapter 12, in the end of all things, the sum of man's life is to fear God and to keep his commandments. The purpose, the foundation of your life is to love and respect God so much that you listen to what he says. And yet there is, of course, another reference point that we have to look at. So again, we look at the Proverbs chapter 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Again, notice what this is paired with. The fear of the Lord, wisdom, and knowledge of his holiness. What we are doing this morning, in fact, without stating it in a mission statement or saying it outright, this is an exercise in the fear of God. We, we gather together and we enter into his presence and if you, if you think about the words we're singing, we're just describing the otherworldly nature of God, his holiness, his mercy, his faithfulness, his goodness, his power, his transcendency. All of this is saying, God, you are so holy. And as we grow in the knowledge of his holiness, we grow in the fear of who he is. To be holy is to be so different than anything else, holy and set apart. And we understand holy fear on a very human scale. Because one way I could teach this lesson very quickly is if someone that you respected in the world of celebrity and politics was at church today and you saw them from afar, you really respect them to the point where you're nervous to talk to them because you respect them so much. 
in some ways, I got to experience this in Sun Valley as well. Uh, we were in Sun Valley, and uh, we were all just hanging out. And all of a sudden, we hear this rumbling. It's like almost like thunder, and the ground begins to shake. And we all just look around like, what is going on? And we look up, and there is something descending, parting the clouds and descending from the sky. And it is, you know, it's like a scene from a movie. What on earth is this? And it gets closer. We realize that it was a helicopter coming down. And that was a moment where you're like, oh, my goodness. What are we about to witness? A helicopter in itself is, will, will cause some awe in your heart. But then when you think about someone who is on a beautiful helicopter landing in the middle of the mountains, you're thinking, who has this kind of influence and power? And so we were all gathering around and from afar. We see them come down to this little helipad and I'm looking around. I'm like, I wonder who's in there. I can't wait to see him. This has got to be somebody important. I'm thinking, is Taylor Swift playing up here anytime soon? Because maybe that might be her. <laughs> We get to wave, and then somebody gets off, and they look all official, and, and we're waving from afar, and it's, they wave back, and we're like, they're waving at us. <laughs> somebody with a helicopter landing in Sun Valley knows I'm alive. <laughs> and then, of course, I shift my attention to the topic of the fear of God, and I realize when it comes to the celebrities and the people of influence and power in this world, we tremble for them. And then we come into the presence of God and so often we yawn. The fear of God is to take the respect and the awe that we would have for a person who now is and tomorrow will be gone and to realize that that belongs to God. Listen to how this psalmist describes it. Who in the heaven can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. If we want another word to attach to the fear of the Lord, it would be reverence. When God speaks, we listen because he's altogether worthy. We look forward to the day when, in fact, he will descend. And every knee will bow for him. And we will be blown away by how everything else, everyone else, every person you've ever respected will completely pale in comparison to who sits enthroned on the other side of the veil. That is the fear of God in the awe and the majesty of who we believe in today. And when you have that fear of God, you'll listen to their instruction. When you have the fear of God that you believe he's the creator of all things, your life. His majesty and power are unmatched. When he speaks, you will listen. The fear, the awe of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, why does it matter? We look again to the Proverbs to begin to answer questions. Why should we be listening to the invitation to have such an utter awe of God. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn away from the snares of death. When we fear God, respect him with reverence, his authority in awe, it says that itself is the fountain of life. That is the beginning of your spiritual life. For those of you who know the day of your salvation and you have the moment of joy when it hits your heart, you had a moment when it brought the fountain of life into your heart and it was a moment of amazing and awesome and radical fear of the Lord. You departed from evil, you gave up on your own wisdom and you submitted to God. And what we do today, if there's any life in what we do, 
If there is life when we enter into these gates with thanksgiving in our hearts, if there's life in the preaching of the word, if there's anything that will bring more abundant life into your life, it will be because of the honor and the respect and the awe that you have for God himself. And the contrasting half of this proverb is why it matters. Because God loves us, he gives us a fountain of life and he reveals to us us in his wisdom the snares of death. And this is part of the reason God calls us to fear him. We have another reference point in a story of the Old Testament to understand the fear of God as we think about respecting him by obeying him in the very story of how we get the law in the first place. Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 19, God is calling Moses to give him the law on top of a mountain, Mount Sinai. And he creates a boundary around the mountain that the people would not cross so that Moses could play the intercessor. He gets the law, brings it to the people. And in their boundary, they're waiting to see what happens with Moses on top of the mountain. And here's what they witness. Verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak lest we die. They're exhibiting the unhealthy fear of God. Majesty, power, cracking thunder. And Moses is going to correct them in what could seemingly be a contradiction. Look what he says. Moses said to them, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Don't be afraid. God wants you to experience fear. Don't be afraid of God. Be afraid of sin. Don't be afraid of the lawgiver. Be afraid of breaking the law. Because the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life and it prevents you from the snares of death. Directly after Proverbs 1 tells us of the fear of the Lord, look what it says. It's going to give a a survey of the opposite of the fear of the Lord, which is an acceptance of sin. It says in Proverbs chapter 1, four verses later, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. It is a snare of death. As we consider the fear of the Lord today as a boundary against violating the design, going outside the law, we listen to this proverb that says, don't consent to sin. And we live in a time where sin is asking for your consent around every corner. I can say with confidence that almost every single one of you has a sin machine in your pocket right now. And it asks you in faster than you can unlock your screen. It asks you to consent to envy of people who are living a better life than you. It asks you to consent to greed, opportunities to make money despite the well-being of others, ask you to consent to lust. And without even looking at the phone, you'll leave this sanctuary and you will be asked to consent to the simple sin of pride almost everywhere you go. We live in a time where we now celebrate the seed of all sin, which is pride. And so many of you will consider consenting Pride is the sin that enters the heart at the cost of the fear of God. We lose the fear of God when we become prideful and wise in our own eyes. And the fear of God matters because nothing I'm doing right now is boldness to preach against envy and lust and greed and pride in our culture. I'm not being bold. I'm afraid of the right things. 
I'm afraid of falling into the victim of being a prideful pastor and a prideful husband, a prideful father. Because I realize that the lawgiver has put fear in my heart that I might not sin. I'll share a story of, actually a story that is my wife's. It's part of her testimony. My wife's part of her testimony. It's, a, it's an F. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife grew up Mormon and then she left the faith when she was right around 18 a, a challenging time in life especially to, to be on your own when it comes to a worldview. and so fairly common to that type of story she was a very let's call her a soft atheist during her college years um, just trying to figure out what she believed, trying to figure out what to live for, trying to put herself through college. And during that time, she had some people in her life that had figured out an amazing and easy and fun way to make a lot of extra money. They had, they had taken jobs to dance in the midnight hour on stage in a nightclub for money. It's an enticing endeavor when you're a poor college student and it seems as though you got your whole life in front of you. What's a, a little fun when you're young? And even without a strong conviction from a biblical reference point or from a church community, my wife never went down that road. And it's always struck me as to why. She said, I never could have done that because my mother would have killed me. <laughs> she had in her life someone that loved her so much and was with her so much that she actually put the fear of evil into her heart. And we today, we're being invited to have a relationship, a friendship and a covenant with someone who loves you so much and will be with you wherever you go, faithfully, morning by morning, they will put the fear of sin into your heart. This is how Jesus teaches on the topic of the fear of God in Luke chapter 12. He says, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed nor hidden that will not be known, uh, elevating and exalting the reality of God's power in knowing you. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in the, in the inner room will be proclaimed on the housetop. Where can you go to flee the presence of God? Where can you hide a secret sin? What can you do when you entice sin that God will not ask and account for? And then Jesus says this, and I'll say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after have no more that they can do to you, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him. After he is killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. All of you will leave this place and you will be confronted with one simple question. Who do you fear in the sense of you respect them so much you'll listen to them? You, you respect the culture so much you will bend the knee to it. You respect your boss and his hunger for more money in the bottom line that you will bend your knee to him. You respect your own lust and your own pleasure so much. And Jesus says, here it is. Don't fear man. The worst they can do to you is kill you. <laughs> Cancel you, kill you, threaten you. But there is a God who knows you and loves you. And he holds your eternity in his hands. And I love that Jesus says, friends, because this is never overstated enough. The fear of God is not being afraid of God. The fear of God is choosing the right authority in your life to respect with reverence. 
So how do we get it? The simple truth of the matter as you read the Proverbs to give us an answer is the fear of the Lord is given to anyone who seeks it and desires it. The, the Proverbs, even in chapter 1, will say that Lady Wisdom, Wisdom goes out as to the town square is inviting everyone to hear the instruction. Inviting everyone to know wisdom that will prevent them from the terrors that befall you. And she says, you did not choose to fear the Lord. And then in Proverbs chapter 2, it says this. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. James says, anybody who lacks wisdom, let him ask and it will be given freely. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. It is, in fact, a step of faith to say, God, I want your ways above my own, and I will do anything I can to know you more. To seek you in the morning by morning, to come and listen to the preaching of the word, to humble myself away from the pride of my own life. It says to treasure it. So a couple reasons to treasure the fear of the Lord. Again, in the survey of the fear of the Lord, you find all of these verses that attach not reasons to be afraid, but reasons to be joyful and excited about this kind of relationship with God. Listen to some of the blessings that we have in the fear of the Lord. It says in Proverbs chapter uh, 1 again, in, or sorry, Proverbs chapter 18, in the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. Confidence in the fear of the Lord. Great confidence. Oswald Chamber listened to that verse and said this, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. I long to be free from the shackles of fear in my life. So I seek the fear of God. It says that in Proverbs chapter one, his descendants will be mighty on earth. Excuse me, Proverbs chapter 19, the fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The purified approach to God is the fear of God. And it says it endures forever. I can't help but think of the church timeline that we live in. I imagine as every generation turns over to the next, they wonder, how do we endure? And certainly, how could we not be wondering that as a church age now, as the statistics year by year work against our favor? One out of every 14 Americans will walk away from some sort of acknowledgement of God. And I have to say that in reading and thinking and meditating on the fear of God, it appears to me that this is the very thing that we seem to be missing as we try to give the torch of God's amazing love and gospel to the next generation. The fear of the Lord endures, it says. And whether we like it or not, most everything else doesn't. Catchy sermons and jokes barely endure to Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Emotional worship services that move you for a moment and are gone just as quickly, they don't endure. Churches with flashy brands and cool style and Christianity that can be reduced to a one-minute devotional, it does not endure. But do you know what does? A reverence for the almighty creator God. <laughs> you give that to your children. You share that with your neighbor. You cultivate that in your heart. We become a church that fears God above man, above pastors, above failing, fallen ministries. And it says that we are pure and we endure. In other words, it's all God or nothing. So the final question is, how do we get it? We seek it. We long for it. We believe that it is actually good for our lives. 
And we learn it, we receive the instruction. And then I'll look at one final picture of the fear of God given us to Scripture. Another surprising passage. As we consider the question of enduring from generation to generation, oftentimes the, the question points back to the answers found in the book of Acts. It's the first church. How did they endure persecution? How did they survive the first century and all of its challenges for being the first generation of Christians? And the Acts gives you those answers. You can study it. You can learn from it. You can be inspired by it. And here's one thing in the book of Acts that we should be clinging to for our time. It says, Acts chapter 9, Then the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, and they were edified. And they were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they were multiplied. We seek it, we desire it, we learn it, and we do it all together. And so often we hear messages in our individual pursuit of God, and we think, okay, I want to grow in the fear of God. Good, good on you, bless you for that. I want to be more disciplined in my morning time, and I want to be more serious to turn off the airwaves and turn on prayer. Good, it'll be good for you. But throughout the survey of the fear of the Lord, God seems to have his spirit fall on groups of people at a time. Exodus 20, the multitude experienced the fear of God. Psalm 89, it was the assembly of the saints. Psalm 115, it was the household of Israel. Acts chapter 9, it was all the churches in the region were walking in the fear of the Lord. Time and time again, we come back to the lesson that God moves through the unity of his people. And so part of this is us collectively praying with one another, edifying, building each other up, away from a culture that is against the truth of God and towards the fear of the Lord. And being okay, being part of a church service, that is interested in the radical fear of God, respecting his word above all else, offending the culture. It is all the reverence of God or it is nothing. And as a way to practice this in the moment, as always, we have this one final act of our service that will in fact point us to the fear of God in our communion. If communion is the respect of the authority of God and the reverence of the awe of God, they meet at the cross. The authority of God to punish sin, to pour his wrath out on the cross of his son, to realize as we gaze upon Christ and hold his body and his blood that his sacrifice was required to keep us from the snares of death. And then the awe of God. God, you would give your body and your blood to save a wretch like us? We stand underneath the fountain of life, not because of anything that we've done, but because we hold these elements in our hands, knowing that they are our only hope of salvation. This is an exercise in the fear of God that will point us to the wisdom and the instruction for our lives.